Hi, hello everyone. My name is Kayla and today I'm going to be responding to Daniel Martinez's video on the Sabbath. So, let's get on to the Christians argue about the Sabbath and to be honest, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of Christians arguing in the flesh. So starting off, Daniel does his typical speech of saying he's tired of Christians arguing over these things. I get the frustration, but this mindset tends to have us neglect having any conversations, helping us to learn more about God. So I think it would be better if he just simply said that we need to be more careful when having these conversations to do so in a loving manner. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Something that's actually really cool is if you look at God's commandments, you'll see they're all based upon loving God or loving each other. But we need to do it in love, not in a legalistic way of I am right and you are wrong. I think we need to be careful calling being assured of something legalistic. Yes, it's good to challenge what we believe so we can have a better understanding of it, but it's also okay to be confident in what you believe in. You can be humble and confident. It doesn't have to be one or the other. That is 3 verse 9 says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. This verse could certainly be used better. It's not saying to not have conversations about the law. It's saying to not have silly arguments of gray areas in the law. If it was truly saying we shouldn't think about the law or whatever, then what do we do with Joshua 1 a? This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. Now, should we as Christians still keep the Sabbath? Some say, well, yes, of course, because God says so in the Old Testament. Exodus 20 verse 8, remember the Sabbath day. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Nor any foreigners residing in your towns. I just thought I'd point out that it's not just for Israel, it's also mentioning the foreigner as well. Does the Sabbath day command say that we have to go to church? The word church isn't even used, it's ecclesia or gathering. Or does it say that we have to rest? On the Sabbath day. Okay, before I see what he says here, the Bible says to rest on the Sabbath day. So let's see what he says. There are some people, those who say that we have to keep the Sabbath. A lot of them also say, well, yes, we have to go to church on the Sabbath day because it is God's day. So there's a lot of different beliefs out there, but I personally believe that we should keep the Sabbath day, but I don't believe that we have to go to church on the Sabbath. In the Bible, when we read it, the Sabbath day was never created just for a day that we have to go to church to worship God. No, it was created so that we should rest. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting because a lot of people will think that they have to go to church in order to be saved. Well, one, going to church doesn't save you. But also, that's not even what the Bible commands us to do on the Sabbath day. In the Old Testament, you are not even allowed to make a fire or to leave your house. I would like to point out, and you can look into this more, but this verse is likely misunderstood. He's talking about Exodus 35 verse 3. Do not light a fire in any of your homes on the Sabbath day. Now, I would like to point out that in those days, when you're lighting a fire, you're very likely doing it for work. So it's likely just saying don't work on the Sabbath day, but feel free to look into that more. Either way, however the correct way of understanding that verse is, is irrelevant to if it's done away with or not. You're just trying to say since you don't like it, we shouldn't follow it, but that's a very bad argument. The command was to rest, not even to leave your house. If the Bible truly said that we couldn't even leave our house on the Sabbath day, then how did Jesus live a perfect life when he was doing miracles on the Sabbath? Why do you think the Pharisees were mad at Jesus? Not because he was breaking his law, but because he was breaking theirs. When should we go to church? Well, we are not under the old law of sin and death anymore. We are now under the new covenant, under Jesus, under the law of the Spirit. This is very relevant. Just because we're not under bondage of our sin doesn't mean we shouldn't try to strive to follow God's commandments. We need to look at the example of the New Testament. When did the early Christians come together to worship God? The 
early Christians saw each other on many days, not just on the Sabbath, but on other days too. Acts 2, 46. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. What's funny is I was actually just about to look for that verse and then he mentioned it, so that's cool. It means every day, day by day. So you can do it on the Saturday, Sunday, every day of the week. In fact, you should worship God every day of your life. It is helpful having a set day to come together and worship God. But I think the problem with this is it often gets us in a mindset of only worshiping God one day a week. If there were a day that the early Christians met together more, it was on the first day of the week. Acts 20 verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. We don't know the main day they gathered, but using this verse to say the Sabbath is now on Sunday is not a good point because the Bible also mentions how they met other days of the week as well. In Acts 2 verse 46, it says, And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together to the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. It's okay to gather together on the first day of the week, the second, the third, but to say the Bible says that we must gather together on the first day, we need to be careful of that. Here's another example. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up. So Daniel mentions 1 Corinthians 16 2 as another verse to show that Sunday is the Sabbath day now. But the thing is, this verse isn't about going to church. It's about setting aside money. 1 Corinthians 16 2 On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save to the extent that he prospers, so that no collections will need to be made when I come. The first day of the week is on a Sunday. Yes, I agree that Sunday is the first day of the week, but God tells us that the Sabbath day is on the seventh day of the week. Exodus 28-11 Remember to dedicate the Sabbath day. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Most of you know this already. They came together to worship God on the Sunday, the first day of the week, not the Sabbath, because that day was for rest. Yes, they sometimes did meet on Sunday, but they met on other days too. And also, the Sabbath is for rest, but that doesn't mean we can't see each other on that day. It's interesting because Daniel is implying that church is on the sabbath which would be when we meet but he's also saying that you can't meet on the sabbath in matthew 12 verse 1 jesus was with his disciples on the sabbath day. at that time jesus passed through the grain fields on the sabbath what's interesting is the pharisees were not happy about this because it was going against their rules and traditions but it was not going against god's right they did it on the first day to honor the resurrection of christ the Bible doesn't say they came to see each other to honor the resurrection, so Daniel needs to be careful saying this. Also, that's assuming that Jesus resurrected on Sunday, and we don't know for sure that they resurrected. And I would like to encourage you to look into that, but I would like to ask, how does Friday to Sunday equal three days and three nights? The day was mentioned. It was always on the first day of the week. It was not always the first day of the week. For example, Mark 16 verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week. Daniel is trying to make his point that Jesus rose again on Sunday. And the verse he used is good, but the translation is poor. And I would argue a better translation would be Mark 16 9. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Translation is key to understanding. One translation says he rose again on the first day of the week, while the other translation says he already rose again. There is an interesting video in the description if you'd like to know more about when Jesus possibly died. What you need to understand is the difference between the old covenant and the new. So although many pastors will say new covenant, a better word to use would be renewed covenant. A verse often used for them to be able to say new covenant is Jeremiah 31 verse 31. Look, the days are coming, the Lord's declaration, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The word used for new is Kadesh, 
And Kadesh can also be translated as repaired, renewed, or restored. You can see it translated like this in 1 Samuel 11, 14, 2 Chronicles 15, 8, Psalms 103, verse 5, and so forth. 1 Samuel 11, verse 14, so we can renew the kingship. 2 Chronicles 15, 8, he renovated the altar. Psalm 103, verse 5, you renew the face of the earth. Unlike what some will say, this word can and is translated different ways. I think it's good to be aware of this because knowing something is new versus renewed can make a big difference in your understanding of something. Like knowing the covenant can be renewed or fixed versus completely thrown out and start over can make a big difference. We are not under the old law of sin and death anymore. We have been made free. If they don't understand this, there will always be disagreements regarding foods like pork. We are not held by the bondage of our sin. Jesus did not save us from his law. He saved us from our punishment from breaking his law. So Peter then asked, So what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Many pastors will teach yes. Yet if you keep reading, this is what Paul says. By no means. Just because Jesus paid for our sins, doesn't mean we should just stop caring and just do whatever sins we want. We should strive to do God's will, to show love for Him. In 1 John 5 verse 3, it says, For this is what love for God is, to keep His commands. Now His commands are not a burden. And then there were these, some of these Israelites that said, No, they have to go and follow all our Old Testament laws, over 600 of them. They have to be circumcised. They have to do this and this and this and this. Ironically, not as many Israelites follow God as you would think. Even in the Bible, you can see God's people time and time again disobey Him and do their own thing. With that being said, I don't know why Daniel is negative towards the idea of people following God to tell others to follow God too, because God's commandments are good for us, they help us. Like, I don't see the problem with telling people to love each other and be nice to each other. So the disciples came together, they talked about it, and they discussed how should they handle this. From everything they've learned from Jesus Christ, how should the Gentiles now live under Christ to fully worship Him? They agreed that they should not force them to obey all those Old Testament laws. They shouldn't force them to be circumcised. We don't know how everyone did it, but we do know how one group did it according to the Bible in Acts 15 verse 29. To put no greater burden on you than these necessary things, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. They started off with telling them four things to work on instead of overwhelming them with all the commandments of the Bible, which can be overwhelming at first. They gave them four things to focus on. They agreed that they should not force them to obey all those Old Testament laws. Colossians 2 verse 16, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. He's going to explain that now everything has been fulfilled in Christ. This verse is not telling them to do whatever they want and not worry about what people think. It's telling them to not worry about what other people think when they're following God's commandments. They had to talk about what aspects of the Mosaic law and the Jewish traditions they had to follow. That's why the apostles came together and they discussed this issue, this problem. Daniel, if what you're saying is true, that is a huge violation of the Bible. The Bible says to not add to or take away. And to say that they were just picking and choosing what commandments still apply to us today is a very slippery slope. This was their decision. Verse 19, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols. Okay, we already went over Acts 15, but they're not saying that these are the only commandments that apply to us today. They're just given a starter of commandments to work on. But if the apostles, if it was important for the Holy Spirit to lead the apostles to write about the Sabbath in the New Testament, they would have done so. They would have included it here. 
but they didn't. How many times does God need to mention something in order for us to do it? Here are just a few verses that show God tells us to keep his commandments. The beginning of the Bible mentions keeping the commandments a lot, so there's really not a point for later on to mention it, yet it still does sometimes. Now listen to this. Romans 14 verse 5 says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. This verse is taken out of context. This verse is not about the Sabbath. It's about Eden. Daniel, if you're going to be teaching this stuff, you really got to make sure you have the context correct. So let us follow scripture. Yes, we should follow scripture and we should also make sure we're following the context of it as well. Okay guys, I got halfway through, uh, but this video is getting kind of long, so I'll stop here. Let me know if you want to see a part two. And Daniel, if you're watching this, it would be cool to have a conversation with you. And if you guys want me to respond to any other videos, just let me know and I'll see what I can do. If you have any questions or comments, just please leave them down below and I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you so much for watching and please make sure to test me and I'll see you guys later. Bye!